everybody. Uh, happy to be with you all today. Uh, my name is Mitt Dunham. I work at the Southern Appalachian Forest Conservation Director with the Rough Grouse Society and American Woodcock Society. Um, as our regional director, I manage our conservation program across the mountain region, big case, but for us, that's North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, Kentucky, and Southwest Virginia. Uh, I'm going to talk to you all today a little bit about our uh, working forest program uh, and specifically fire management and how that has some uh, intersection with that uh, and also has some opportunities for thinking about that here in uh, North Georgia, specifically on the Cadu Peak. This thing working? Maybe, maybe not. Right now. All right. I'm trying to get away from the standing on the podium with the uh, politicians before everyone said uh, I have the distinct privilege of being the last presenter of the day, so I recognize that and hold that everybody being here all day. So appreciate you all sticking around. For those of you who are less familiar with us as an organization, uh, the Rough Cross Society has been around since 1962. So we have a relatively long tenure in wildlife conservation here in America. Uh, our mission is to unite conservationists to improve wildlife habitat and forest health. Obviously, as our name implies, rough grouse and American woodcock are our two primary flagship species. So when we think about our conservation programming, we really are thinking about promoting healthy forests and abundant wildlife in the broader sense of those words. So we're a national conservation nonprofit organization. Uh, working primarily in four regions across the country. Uh, shortly before I came on board, so about four years ago now, we underwent a pretty substantial restructuring at the organization where we began implementing what we refer to as our Working Forest Program. And this Working Forest Program has really been a way for us to better align our conservation work at that intersection of sustainable forestry and wildlife habitat. They're uh, able to realize landscape scale, broader scales with our habitat restoration efforts, moving away from more localized habitat improvements, really moving more holistically towards landscape restoration, uh, better achieving more partnerships and funding opportunities, diversifying our business model, uh, and utilizing commercial timber harvesting and sustainable forest management as one of the primary drivers of creating more diverse forest landscapes. Um, a little bit of species specific information for you about rough grass because we are the rough grass society. Uh, we know that we've lost 71% of rough grass population abundance here in the Southern Appalachians since 1989. That is a very dramatic reduction in the species population abundance over only a three decade period, and it's really concerning. We know that the primary driver of that decline is the loss of habitat diversity, and specifically the lack of biologically significant levels of young forest habitat. Those actively regenerating young forest stands in that five to 20 year age class that provide critical high stem density to cover for rough grass and a broad suite of forest wildlife species. But it's not just about young forest habitat, it's really about the interspersion and the juxtaposition of those young forest stands with more diverse forests overall, including the right mix of early, middle-aged, mature, and late successional forests at landscape scales. When we think about priority sites in the Southern Appalachians, places where we currently have higher rough grass abundance and probably the best opportunity to benefit the species, is typically in more of our mid to high elevation areas, you know, greater than 2,000 feet in elevation, and typically our more mesic forest sites or ecological zone. We think about rough grass as an indicator species. They are an indicator for healthy and resilient forest ecosystems that have high amounts of age class and structural diversity. They're also an umbrella species in that their decline is consistent with the decline of a broad suite of at risk wildlife, including a broad suite of early successional obvious species. And a number of more what have been traditionally thought of as more late successional obvious species that we know require more habitat diversity and structural diversity than our forest landscapes currently provide. 
So it's not just a rough grouse issue, it's really a habitat issue and a forest health issue. And so we also know historically a combination of both human disturbance and non-human natural disturbances created more of a diverse mosaic forest age platform structures that our southern Appalachian landscape has today. And that includes human disturbances from Native Americans, so pre-Euro American colonization, where we had very forest land for cultivation and settlement. We had frequent burning by Native Americans, uh, often as large landscape scale. And we also had oil field abandonment as shifting agricultural practices were used and people moved around the landscape. That combined with non-human natural disturbances, severe weather events, lightning emission, and also pests and pathogens, including southern pine beetle, as well as keystone wildlife species, uh, such as uh, eastern bison and elk, that are currently extirpated from this part of their range, or at least mostly so, or extinct entirely, uh, were if not creators of more desert, more diverse conditions, and more early successional habitat. They definitely helped maintain those conditions on the landscape. And so here's an image of, uh, I've been told by Eric, I need to hang out around here a little bit so I can be on camera. So I'll try and center myself around the podium a little more. Eric. <clears throat> here we have a kind of interesting figure, I think, showing known population occurrences of Native American settlements before European colonization, as well as potential zones of human influence. So I think it's really important to recognize that, especially here in the eastern United States, you know, this landscape was far from an untouched, pristine wilderness. Humans were part of this ecosystem for a very long time and were architects in terms of helping create some of the ecological conditions uh, that once existed. So the role of anthropogenic fire really can't be ignored when you think about that history of human influence on the landscape. You know, we know today that about half of our ecological zones in the Southern Blue Ridge are what we consider fire adapted, right? Combination of different oak forest ecosystems and hard pine mixed oak hard pine ecosystem. In the far past, before European came, uh, we also know that humans set most fires. Uh, the exact number is hard to estimate, but some evidence suggests more than 80%. We know this from five star research and the correspondence of high fire periods with dormant seasons and lightning conditions were infrequent to non existent. In the more recent past, where we have even better data, as in the past 100 years, we know that humans have set the map in the vast majority of wildfire events. These are not prescribed burns, these are uh, wildfires that were human ignited, and that is up to 94 to 99 percent, whereas lightning emissions in the mountains and the Appalachians are really only uh, upwards of 7.8% on the higher levels. Now, lightning emission was and is more common in some places, specifically the Ridge and Valley province and more eastern parts of the southern Blue Ridge. Uh, but generally, you know, even where it's higher, it's only 8 to 24% of overall fire ignitions. Here's just another graphic of. Uh, Area of burn from a study that looked at wildfires in West Virginia and Western Virginia. And over a 33 year period, where they observed the vast majority of fires were anthropogenic and they peaked, uh, you know, kind of in the spring and fall, with lightning emission being a bit more common in June and July, um, but still not as high as the overall kind of anthropogenic emissions. So, that's kind of the laying the groundwork for where we are today which is uh, this. So this is the problem. This is a beautiful Southern Appalachian forest and landscape as seen off of the Blue Ridge Parkway in North Carolina or North Georgia, Chattahoochee. But the unnaturally single age closed canopy conditions of today's forests are simply not providing the habitat diversity that a broad suite of wildlife species depend upon. This is what, from a wildlife habitat perspective, we refer to the Sea of Sandus. And so you can see this based on some of the evidence, right? So here is age class distributions across all seven national forest units in the Southern Appalachians. And across literally what is millions of acres of public lands, we only have uh, about 1.3% young forest conditions. 
And so it's no surprise when the vast majority of the landscape is dominated by forests that are 80 to 140 years old. Most of these forests were cut in the early 1900s and they grew back during a century of wildfire suppression policies. It's no surprise when you have forest distribution of age classes that looks like this, that species which require more early successional habitat, as well as species which require more late successional habitat are all declining across the landscape. And this is true both regionally across public lands in the Southern Appalachians, but it's also true here on the Chattahoochee in North Britain. So you can see that same trend when it comes to the clustering of forest stands between 80 and 140 years old, with very little forest on the early successional side and very little forest on the late successional side. Um, kind of looked at in terms of some numbers. We know based on the Chattahoochee Sports Plan that their uh, projections were to create about one and a half to five and a half percent for the successional forest. There's currently, based on the forest uh, stand data, only 0.0%, 0.05% for the successional forest. And so the forest is not currently meeting those objectives. It's especially not meeting them in the higher elevation areas where we know it's desperately needed for species like red grass. And these numbers are very low compared to what some of the best available science tells us will be best for supporting specifically bird diversity and abundance. So I want to put this out there to highlight the conservation need. This is in no way intended to be a finger wag at the Forest Service. We appreciate and partner with the Chattahoochee in a lot of ways. And we think we really have a bright future to be able to address some of these concerns, but there are concerns, and those concerns are really that lack of habitat diversity. And so it's a lack of habitat diversity, not just in terms of age class, but also in terms of percent canopy cover, percent openness. Like I said before, we know that a lot of our forest ecosystems are fire adapted. Uh, historically, were much more open. And so, a lot of species which require more open forest conditions, including woodlands and savannas, uh, are also declining across the region uh, at, at fast rate. And so, this is our challenge and our opportunity to take landscapes that are currently dominated by more single age, closed canopy conditions, where we typically see an underrepresentation of young forest not enough open forests, not enough late successional forests, and through conservation planning, through active forest management, increase the proportions of those underrepresented habitats and move landscapes more towards desired forest conditions. And so at the Rough Grass Society, we've been primarily doing that through one of our focal area frameworks that we refer to as dynamic forest restoration blocks, or DFRBs. DFRBs are, it's just a jargony way of talking about a habitat diversification focal area, uh, but that's what we call it, the DFRB. Uh, essentially, it's about identifying landscape blocks that on the lower end are a few thousand acres, on the upper end are 50, 70,000 acres, kind of landscape scale, watershed scale blocks, uh, where there's currently, you know, a dominance of single age to close canopy forests, a lot of our forests. Uh, doing planning to, to assess current conditions compared to desired conditions for a suite of focal wildlife species. Doing implementation to achieve desired conditions under a relatively short time frame, and then doing monitoring to both assess wildlife populations and also changes in vegetative conditions as we move landscapes more towards desired conditions. So a way to test our hypothesis and to be adaptive to measure our progress as we go. And so this is an example of one of our dynamic forest restoration blocks in Tennessee. This is a DFRB that we developed with Tennessee Division of Forestry, Tennessee Wildlife Resources, and a group of other partners. This is on state lands. This is a portion of the Tusa Wildlife Management Area and also a Lone Mountain State Forest. And what we did within this forest block, which is what we do in a lot of our focal areas, is we allocated different parts of the property into different management zones, so different management types. That includes a mixed succession zone, a fire management zone, which is in red, and then a late successional zone, which is in blue. And the idea is that we want to increase those proportions of young, open, and late successional forests on the landscape as part of a win 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 to create more diverse habitat for most, if not all, forest wildlife. 
And within that late successional zone, the approach is more passive management, it's protecting areas, or even enhancing and accelerating more late successional conditions through you know, uneven name management and their thin improvements. The fire management zone is really more focused on creating and then maintaining more permanent woodlands and savannas. And then that mixed succession zone is where we're really doing long term silvicultural rotations, you know, even age management, different versions of the shelter wood sequence and clear cut methods to move forest stands from early to middle age to mature as part of a shifting mosaic on the landscape. I'm going to take some drinks of water as I'm talking because my throat's a little dry today. So as we think about fire management uh, within the context of BFRDs and more landly, more broadly to manage landscapes, you know, I kind of think about fire management on a continuum from more intensive use of fire at kind of stand level and what we could think of as maybe less intensive use of fire at a broader scale. And so kind of thinking about this concept a little bit on the more intensive end, we have the judicious use of fire at a stand level with more of a focus on using fire to achieve certain silvicultural objectives. This approach is often more compatible with timber production because we have more control of the fire effects at that stand level. And with this approach, open forests are usually created more temporally as you're moving a stand to a different type of silvicultural rotation as, as a shifting mosaic cat works across the landscape. On the less intensive, maybe less intensive is the right word. I'm kind of struggling with what the right word is for this. So, on the less intensive side of the spectrum, we have the broad use of fire at the burn block or the landscape level, where you're less focused on achieving stand level silvicultural objectives. This might be less compatible with timber production because you have less of control on fire effects to your, your crop trees, your timber trees. And the approach might be more on just creating and maintaining more open forest conditions with woodland and savanna restoration here. And so, just you know, for the sake of conversation, I'll provide some examples of maybe the more intensive approach to the less intensive approach of using fire and applying it on the landscape. So here we have kind of maybe on the more intensive, you know, stand level application of fire to achieve sort of cultural objectives of regenerating a young oak forest. You might have today uh, a mature stance that is you know, 80 to 140 years old, a lot of our forests look like. Um, you might want to regenerate. Well, you might go in first and you know, do a commercial timber harvest as part of an establishment cut where you take out your C and your B trees in this lollipop diagram and you create conditions that look like that. Um, you're going to start to develop uh, you know, regeneration, new growth in the understory. It's going to be a mix of more fire tolerant, more and less fire tolerant trees, which are also more desirable trees, less desirable trees. You can then integrate fire into that, that process to help tip the competitive advantage towards trees that are more fire tolerant, more fire adapted, such as uh, our oak species. Once you start to develop more of a high quality advanced oak regeneration layer in that subcategory, you have a nice crop of oak trees, and then you can come in, you can do your overstory removal harvest, and you can release uh, that young oak stand. And that's where we get that young forest habitat that we know that grass and lots of species need. And then, as part of that shifting mosaic on that stand level, that stand is eventually going to develop back into a mature forest over 80 to 120 years, and you repeat the process in different places. You know, this can be applied as part of a uniform shelter wood sequence, as I just mentioned, or fire can be integrated into what we call more irregular shelter wood. So it's like an uneven age shelter wood, where you either have the fun German word of Demelschlag, an expanding gap shelter wood sequence, where you're putting in different sized patches, you're, you're establishing oak along the edges of those patches, and you're expanding them over time with multiple entries. You end up with kind of this mosaic of a few different ages, and fire can be integrated into these systems as well. And kind of what's referred to, you know, commonly with, with uh, the National Forest, a two age cut, right? An overstory removal with reserves, where you might work through that full shelter with sequence, but when you get to the time of a commercial timber harvest or the overstory removal, you might leave some reserve trees around as uh, long term legacy and biological reserves on that land structure and also mass. 
want to do a quick plug for the benefit of mid-story removal treatments. So obviously we're talking a lot about fire today, but when we talk about mid-story removals, we're basically talking about mimicking the effects of many fires with one injury. So a lot of our stands have very well-developed subcanopies, very well-developed mid-stories, uh, usually a more uh, mesic tree species, you know, mesification of our forests. So red maple, sweet birch, uh, sweet or mesic trees are often very competitive in these hardwood stands. Uh, and so even with multiple entries of fire, one of the issues we run into is that uh, you know, red maple and sweet birch in particular stump sprout so vigorously that it's very hard to be successful at regenerating oak trees with fire alone. And so mid-story removals come in as a really useful free harvest preparatory treatment. It's a form of forest stand improvement uh, where you basically go in in advance of a commercial timber harvest. You typically apply the treatment with herbicide as part of a Hackensworth treatment. Um, set back that mid-story. Most of your stems that are one inch to 10 inch diameter other than your oak to hickories. And then, you know, if implemented correctly, you end up with conditions that look something like this at the bottom. More open subcanopy, more diffused light or gray light hitting the ground floor, letting you establish uh, some high quality oak regeneration that then is ready to release either through an establishing cut or an overstore removal. So that's you know, some examples maybe of the more, more intensive stand level use of fire to manage for oak. Uh, here's kind of maybe a more or less intensive approach you know, thinning and burning. Using commercial or non commercial uh, thinning treatments to create more open conditions, and then using prescribed burning primarily as a tool to maintain those conditions and to promote a uh, higher amount of herbaceous cover in the understory and lower your woody stem density. So, savanna or woodland restoration. And I'll say as well that where kind of the use of mechanical treatments, where commercial and non commercial thinning is maybe not an option. Uh, thermal thinning in the form of more moderate to higher intensity burning can definitely help create some of these open forest conditions on its own as well. Ooh. Yeah, and so the cool thing as kind of a, a silviculture nerd for me is that we also now have some pretty cool stocking charts that can help us kind of understand the way to set up these thinning treatments when we're doing women's bad restoration uh, thinning work. So, this is from a, a paper from uh, Dan Day, which is some research station. And you can see kind of as we typically as foresters think about uh, the different stand stocking ratios and we're finding intermediate thinning treatments. Uh, that also corresponds to how we think about savannas and open versus closed woodland conditions. You know, another example of maybe the less intensive, broader application of prescribed fire is just backcountry burning. Uh, this is a burn that the Rough Grouse Society and Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation helped complete on the Jefferson National Forest in Virginia, which was 5,000 acres that we were able to complete burning in one day. So we basically burned this entire ridge top. And uh, it was burned, made a burn. It was a big fire. <laughs> and you have to know that when you have this moderate intensity burn being applied to a large landscape block in that way, we're going to have less control of what happens on that stand level. We're going to have less control of potential impacts to timber species. But we're definitely going to have some thermal thinning as we have inherent variability in the topography and cool conditions across that landscape. And I know from this burn block in particular, uh, this burn created a lot of young and open forest habitat. Uh, it scorched some trees through thermal thinning, which, from a habitat diversity standpoint, is good. So I'll kind of finish, I'm probably getting towards the end of my 30 minute block here, but I'll finish up just kind of talking a little bit about the Chattahoochee and some uh, challenges and opportunities to apply applying fire in different ways on the Chattahoochee land forest. So, you know, as I'm sure many people are aware, the Chattahoochee as a guide about the forest plan is allocated to different management prescription areas. Some of the management prescriptions align well with the different management zoning that I was talking about within our dynamic forest plot as well. But you can see that some of those prescriptions have explicit early successional habitat objectives, and some of them don't. Uh, additionally, some of those management prescriptions on the Chattahoochee uh, are suitable for timber production in terms of long term silvicultural rotations. And some are not. Some of them, commercial timber harvesting can be used for certain reasons, but are not compatible with kind of that 
make successional approach to doing kind of a long term shelter based sequence. However, we do have the opportunity across basically all of the JWG to use prescribed writing. So that is an opportunity. And I would say that when, when I kind of think about the different approaches to fire, you know, using fire more intensively on a stand level to create open conditions more temporally as part of a shelter wood sequence, or using fire more broadly, maybe less intensive for the stand, but just more broadly across the landscape, that both have their applications. And that's going to be guided largely by the management prescription you're working in. So, you know, maybe where there's areas that are less suited for timber production. We can think about a broader, less intensive use of prescribed burning, where timber production is one of the goals. Maybe we're looking at integrating fire more towards you know, a silvicultural rotation, managing for high quality wood stems. So that, that application of fire is going to differ, and we have the opportunity to think about both as part of the overall uh, And then you know, we also know this is an ecological zone mapping for the Nature Conservancy. Uh, broken down into fire adapted ecosystems and non fire adapted ecosystems. And we know that the majority of the Chattahoochee, a lot of our landscape is fire adapted, but even more so than some of the adjacent national forests and southern Appalachians. And that those fire adapted ecological zones, you know, really range uh, a wide range of different elevational gradients and sites uh, from shortly pine and oak ecosystems on the lower end. To high elevation red oak ecosystems on the higher end. And at elevations that are compatible with where we know priority sites are for rough grass. So that's uh, that's all I have. Uh, I think I'm a little bit over a couple minutes, so I apologize for that. But if there's any time for questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you. Questions. All right, thank you very much, Nick. I really yeah, appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> how about one more round of applause for Nick and for all of our speakers today? Thank you. Thank you.